All right, thank you. Can everybody, this is working? Okay, great. Um, well, thank you very much, Real World Crypto. This is one of my favorite events. Uh, I think my favorite event, actually, of the year. Uh, this is, it's an honor for me to be back, and I want to talk today about a project that's been brewing at Cloudflare for a few years now and, and was released uh, last year, in 20, 2017. Um, it's a project that uses some interesting cryptography, and it was um, mostly done by Brendan McMillian, who didn't want to come up here, so I'm doing the presentation. Uh, so the basic problem is uh, geographically distributed key management. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, first, let's, let me explain a little bit what Cloudflare is. It's not a vendor pitch or anything, just an explanation. Trust me, this helps set, thing up, set things up. Uh, so Cloudflare sits in front of websites and web services. Uh, it blocks attacks, it caches content. Uh, there's something like seven million domains that use Cloudflare, and uh, Cloudflare is situated all around the world. There's, this is an old map, but there's 129 locations or so. And uh, in order to do what Cloudflare needs to do in terms of caching and blocking content, it, um, it needs to terminate TLS. So if you are anywhere in the world, you can connect to a website, um, it'll go to the closest Cloudflare node, and you do your handshake, and then um, it continues back to the website. So um, in order to, to do that, you need a, a TLS, you need a private key, and that means the private key has to be everywhere, everywhere in the world. And not everyone is comfortable with their keys being everywhere. And it's not just Russia, I'm not going to pick on them, but every, every, needs of, every need of every customer is, is different. And um, I, I mean, just to be clear, Cloudflare does not give out private keys to anybody, really. Um, but that doesn't mean that customers are necessarily comfortable with the private keys, the keys to the kingdom for their websites being anywhere in the world. Um, so there are a lot of other reasons you might want to limit where your keys are, are going, but you still want the benefit of a global CDN all around the world. So there's privacy regulations, uh, physical security, general paranoia, there are all these sort of things. So what, what do we really want to do to help these customers feel more safe? Um, well, first we want them to be able to choose where in the world their keys are kept. And uh, if, if we do this, we want it to actually be something that we can deploy and something we can manage and something that actually fits into Cloudflare's eco ecosystem, something that works for now and works for the future. So that means fitting it into uh, this engine. We're not, we're not going to rewrite the way that data distribution in the network works at Cloudflare, um, but let's look at the components that we have uh, of the engine of of Cloudflare to, to see what we have at our disposal for limiting access to keys. And you can kind of think of this in terms of constraints and components. One of the constraints is legacy client software. We're not going to change TLS. We're not going to ship a browser. We're not going to change the way that people use the internet. It has to, uh, when you connect to Cloudflare, it's regular HTTPS. So um, in order to have keys in a different location and still terminate TLS, there's something called keyless SSL, which um, this map is not showing up at all, but <laughs> imagine that somewhere in Europe. Um, so you need a private key to actually uh, continue <laughs> to make a, make a TLS connection. So you connect to uh, whatever the nearest connection is, and there's only one part of the TLS handshake that actually needs a private key. And you can actually put that somewhere else, in, in this case, in another country. And during the handshake, you do your, your round trips in the handshake, and then the call out to where the key is to do the private key operation. So this is, this is keyless SSL. It has a pretty severe latency cost um, because network is pretty high latency. So um, depending on where it is in the world, this can add quite a bit uh, of the connect, <coughs> quite a bit of time to your connection. This is uh, a single round trip, but you know it's a viable cost. It's cryptographically though colossal. You saw how much it took for post quantum crypto algorithms earlier today. Um, what other tools do we have, or what other components of the system? Uh, one is a provisioning system. Uh, this is how Cloudflare configures the system, configures all these machines that handle requests. There's a central provisioning system, a template of the configuration that basically just takes whatever the name of the system is and uh, applies it to a template and you know shoots it out to where the where the system is and where this edge mach edge machine is. There's no there's no real uh, way to do a key registry. These, the number of machines changes a lot. 
data centers are added every week, D different machines are added to different data centers, things are taken out. Uh, this is kind of a, a push-based provisioning system. Um, this is non-interactive, and it's really identity-based. The only thing that you use in the configuration for templating is the name. Um, what else we have? Well, uh, there's a globally synchronized database, and this is how, when you change your settings or upload new keys to Cloudflare, this is how it actually gets out to everywhere. There's this, this kind of waterfall of uh, database replication that goes from a central place to regional masters to local masters to whatever. This is, uh, this is very automated. It's, it's anything that you do, that it's very interactive. It changes, but it is bandwidth limited and uh, you can kind of think of it as a, as a broadcast mechanism. So stepping back and saying, okay, what, to, what, what do we have at Cloudflare? We want to build some sort of way to limit access to keys. Uh, we're not rebuilding the engine, um, but we have this kind of identity-based provisioning system, this broadcast database of keys, and this high latency fallback. How do we solve this with cryptography? Um, well, looking back into the world, uh, symmetric cryptography, this has been around since antiquity, one-way functions. Uh, we can kind of evolve to asymmetric cryptography, things from the 70s and whatnot. Um, and, you know, 21st century cryptography, pairing-based crypto, there's, there's a lot of tools in your tool, toolkit. You can go all the way to fully homomorphic, we're not going to go that far. That's, that's, a, that's a bridge too far. So one of the interesting tools in this set of uh, options cryptographically is, is identity-based encryption, which has three main pieces where you have a public key. Uh, this is a, a piece of information you can use to encrypt data to a given identity, and the identity is just a string. Um, there's a master key. This is used to provision private keys to identities, and then the private key itself. The uh, great thing about this is it allows encryption to identities um, <clears throat> even if they don't have their key yet, they haven't been registered in the system, it's, it's uh, sort of preset. And kind of visually, you can think of identity-based encryption in, in this sort of way. You have a master key, you have an extract phase, you have private keys, you send them to the participants. This may be a familiar diagram. Um, and for identity-based encryption for decryption, uh, or for taking content and, and in, encrypting it, you have your public key, you encrypt it to a name, and then you have this ciphertext, you can send it to anybody you want, but only the person with uh, the private key associated with that name can decrypt it. Um, so identity-based encryption was proposed by Shamir in the 80s, um, but it really wasn't realized as a fully functional thing until uh, Bonet and Franklin in 2001, and it uses a uh, mathematical uh, tool called bilinear pairings. So I, I can go deep into this if we want to, and I, and I think we do, it's real world crypto. Uh, let, let's at least cover what we need to to understand this. So um, typically it's two groups, two um, additive groups, and uh, you have a function that goes from these two groups to uh, another group, typically a multiplicative group. And it has this nice property. If you can find a pairing that's easy to execute, it has this property where it's uh, linear in both inputs, uh, which has some interesting properties. Uh, particularly, um, it, al it allows you to uh, solve Diffie-Hellman in either of the two pre-image groups from solving it in the, um, in, in the destination group. So for it, one example of this is, uh, is super singular curves. If you <coughs> have uh, a super singular curve, you can create this pairing that, that sends uh, <coughs> the group elements of these curves to uh, a finite field. So you, typically you have uh, elliptic curve group or a subgroup of elliptic curve going to a finite field. And uh, this leads, led to things like the MOV attack and uh, and if you have an efficient pairing, you can do identity-based encryption. And the first one of which was uh, by Bonet and Franklin. This is from the they pairing. So um, identity-based encryption as, as a tool can be generalized. And if you have pairings, you have efficient pairings that you can use, um, there's the idea of identity-based broadcast encryption, which is uh, a very simple generalization. This is proposed by Delera Blay. Um, this is kind of a reformulation of this concept of multi-receiver ID-based key encapsulation by 
uh, Nigel Smart and other, uh, other folks, but generally it lets you encrypt to a set of identities up to a maximum size, and we call that parameter k. And uh, if you set k equals one, that is identity-based encryption. So it, it's kind of a, a broader generalization of that. You can encrypt to a set of people up to k, or a set of, set of identities. Um, on the converse of that, there's a, a concept called identity-based revocation. And with that, you can encrypt data to every identity minus uh, a, a certain selected subset, up, and to, up to k. And uh, this is also very, very similar to identity-based encryption, um, or a concept of broadcast encryption, where you can revoke particular people from a ciphertext that has been kind of sent out. So, um, two pretty good examples of identity-based broadcast encryption and identity-based revocation uh, are from uh, these two papers, De Lerable and, um, and another, there's another construction from uh, a, a bunch of other folks, at Trapadung and Liber de Panafieu. I'm having, yeah, exactly. There's a, there's a bunch of folks who, who worked on this and made different formulations based on pairings to do um, IBBE and IBR and things like this. But the interesting part of this construction is that uh, the ciphertext size is actually constant. So um, up into, as long as <clears throat> you have set K in advance and set your parameters, you can encrypt to any number of identities, uh, whether they've registered in the system or not, doesn't matter in the same way as identity-based encryption, uh, the ciphertext size is going to be constant for both of these constructions. And uh, the, the second one was built in, <coughs> was demonstrated as part of a build-up to a, a more complex attribute-based encryption scheme. Um, so these, uh, these use pairings, and uh, what sort of pairings should we use? Well, um, <coughs> a common, group, common um, type of pairing that you can use is uh, based on what are called uh, Barreto Nerig curves, and this is a specifically chosen curve, and uh, in, I, <coughs> in pairings there's G1 and G2, and they map to GT. In this case, you have uh, a specifically chosen elliptic curve uh, over a finite field, um, <coughs> a prime finite field, and uh, this, the second group is uh, it, it, you can take an ex a, sort of a 12th extension, uh, the elliptic curve over the, the 12th extension field of uh, finite fields. Um, one of the cool optimizations is they, you can map that down to uh, a curve over FP2, which is a lot smaller, more compact. You can do some uh, operations a lot quickly and send it over to FP12. So um, using the... Uh, <clears throat> the optimal eight pairing, you can have, have use these these curves, and um, and you ha have a nice pairing. You can construct both of these constructions using this. Um, and in particular, one of the curves that is commonly used is is called BN 256, and uh, it says here 128 bit security level. There's a little star there. I'll I'll talk about that in a second. But um, generally, it, even if you you don't Need, you don't really need to know all the details about this, but um, but the first group is essentially 32 bytes, 64 bytes, 192 bytes. You have a function that goes from the first two to the end. And uh, recently, there's been some advancements in uh, the number field civ algorithm for solving Diffie-Hellman in FP12. And as I mentioned earl earlier, if you can solve Diffie-Hellman in the destination group, it lets you solve Diffie-Hellman in the source group. So this lowered the security somewhat to somewhere in the 90-bit range. But generally, BN256 is, is, is rather solid. It's well known. Um, and there's a Go implementation. Cloudflare uses quite a bit of Go um, by Adam Langley. Uh, Brendan McMillian on our team did uh, some assembly uh, speed up for this specific implementation to get a 10x speed up. Um, but the important thing to know is computing one of these pairings is, is, is slow cryptographically if you're comparing it to classic crypto algorithms. But compared to network times, it's actually pretty comparable, thinking of you know, a round trip between two places within, within uh, <coughs> Switzerland. It's, it, it's rather comparable. So. Um, 
stepping back a second, we have this idea of identity-based broadcast encryption, identity-based verification. We have this nice curve setting that's um, been, been used for several years. Um, we can combine those together and uh, build a sort of practical IBBE and IBR scheme. And uh, the, the key, this parameters look like this. They, the public key and the private key, they scale linearly with the size of the set that you're using, but the ciphertext itself is um, rather small, um, 192 two bytes. And uh, this is constant, so it doesn't matter how many elements you put up to K into uh, who your, the destination is, you can, you can still use these constant size ciphertext. So, um, how does this apply to key management? It feels like we've gone on a tangent, but we really haven't. We've really been describing several constructions that map pretty well with the way that the architecture of Cloudflare systems are designed. So, um, considering that you have this IBR and IBBE schemes, um, this is how a theorized, simplified version of GeoKey Manager could work. So, every location in the world, it, or every physical location of 129 locations of Cloudflare would be provisioned a private key so associated with its name. And then a customer could say, hey, I want my TLS key only in Zurich and New York. Or you could say, I want it everywhere except the United States, for example. Um, and then we would encrypt the TLS key to the name of these locations using one of these two schemes and uh, send it out through our distribution mechanism. And then when a connection comes in, we would either use the local identity-based key to decrypt it and you know, finish the TLS handshake, and you can cache that and use it for subsequent requests. Or you would use keyless SSL to connect to whatever the nearest location that actually has access to this key. Um, so this, is, this, this kind of makes sense. This is, this is something that, that would be nice to use. It's uh, maybe not as flexible as we'd like it to be, um, because the network is growing. You s have 129 data centers now. We want this system to work when there's 1,000 data centers, and we don't want any sort of manual intervention. Um, so one kind of wrinkle that you can put in here, that these, these kind of semantics that you'd want would be uh, you can, somebody can choose to put their keys in multiple locations and also have a kind of default for new locations that are added for different regions. And you also might want to blacklist specific locations. So if you know you want everything in, in the United States, but you don't like Kansas City, you can do something like that. So um, because the network is growing, you, we want something really flexible. <coughs> um, and this is where key encapsulation comes in. This is where um, GeoKey managers, the, re the real new parts of it are, is that you can combine these three, <coughs> or, or I guess you can combine the, an IBBE scheme and an IBR scheme with just some simple key splitting. So um, you have a key encryption key, say you're, you, somebody uploads a TLS private key, you encrypt it, encrypt it with this key encryption key, and you can split this into, into two. And uh, one for the region that you're whitelisting for, and one for the region that you're blacklisting, and, uh, and you basically have an overlay. So you need to, ha to be both be in the region that you're allowed and not be in the specific location that's blacklisted. And uh, to get a whitelisted location that's out of a region that you're default off for, you can just simply take the key, uh, the key encryption key and just uh, identity-based broadcast encryption to these extra whitelisted locations. And, and combining these three, you actually get the desired semantics that you need. Um, fitting this into the real system that we use, uh, you have a provisioning server. Uh, this, is, this is the setup phase. And you have the master keys for both the IBBR and IB, oh, sorry, IBBE and IBR scheme. And uh, when you provision each of these new machines, you extract the private keys and, and send them down. And when someone uploads their private TLS key, uh, you can then wrap it with these various key encapsulation mechanisms and uh, send that down the pipeline. And this will replicate all through the system. And none of these intermediate nodes will be able to decrypt this data um, along the way. And even the master database will not be able to decrypt this data. 
And visually, you can kind of imagine it like this. You have half the key, in, and your whitelisted regions are the US and EU, and you don't want these two specific cities I can see there, yeah, Dallas and London, for some reason. Uh, but you do want your keys in Sydney and Tokyo. So uh, combine these together, and <laughs> you can't see the background. But so uh, if anyone were to visit any of these gray pops, gray locations that are outside of, of these regions, uh, you would connect to there, and you would do keyless SSL to whatever the closest uh, network node is. So we have this, this network where pairwise we have a long-lived connection between every single location. And uh, we look at the key, see where it's available, and go to that place. Uh, if you're actually in a location that has access to that key, you just you use the key encapsulation mechanism, decrypt it, and go there. So um, because there's pairings involved, uh, People typically say you can't deploy pairings. They're too slow, they're not really uh, that useful. But when you compare the time, as I mentioned, to network latency, it actually isn't that big of a deal. If, if you're worried this much about where your keys are, this, this hit is, is something that you can occasionally take. So this, is beta, this beta for this is live. There are over 50 customers that are using this. Um, something like 100 to 200 requests per second are uh, being used through this new keyless SSL distributed key mechanism. And uh, we have cryptographic enforcement and compatibility. So um, we've, de we've deployed this sort of thing. But what I described earlier was a, a slight simplification. Um, when you're building a hybrid crypto system, uh, you, you think you have the outer layer and you have the inner layer. And in the system that I described, the outer layer here is this brilliant kind of identity-based system, and you're wrapping this basic symmetric key inside of it. Um, so the thought was, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of these pairing operations, at least one per private key per location, and uh, probably per machine in each location. Uh, can, can we do better? Is there a way to do a better type of encapsulation? And uh, one way to do that is to have a, a three-layer hybrid scheme. So you have your identity-based scheme, and then inside of it you wrap a public key-based scheme, and then inside of that you wrap your um, symmetric scheme. So uh, the, de the details here, I, I can kind of walk through this, but essentially, when you have a certain configuration that says, you know, these are the 10 locations that are whitelisted, or these are the 10 locations that are blacklisted, you create these sets of key enc en encapsulation mechanisms. Uh, in what I described before, this is, you know, uh, a symmetric key that's like AES or something like this, that's split three ways. In this case, what you're encapsulating is a Diffie-Hellman private exponent. Uh, so the interesting thing about this is uh, once you've computed for, for a given configuration, the, this set of configuration, uh, these set of key encapsulations, you only have to have the public values. So um, for each configuration, you, you generate three Diffie-Hellman shares and three Diffie-Hellman public keys, a, a times P, B times P, and C times P. And then when you actually need to wrap the key itself, um, rather than wrapping it with the key encryption key that's just arbitrarily generated, you essentially do a key exchange with your configuration. Um, so every time that you have a new key, you generate your key encryption key this way. So um, you can wrap it with the private key, and you have this kind of Diffie-Hellman uh, type of situation uh, in that uh, you, in, in this case, it's A plus P. You're kind of, rather than key splitting by taking a symmetric key and XORing it, you're using exponents in the Diffie-Hellman case. Um, and for your whitelisted region, the one that is not actually uh, key split, you do this key escrow business, where um, rather than doing a key exchange, you, 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 you do a key exchange and then you just encrypt the key, key encryption key. So. Um, the nice thing about this is that once it's actually distributed, 
um, you only have to do a pairing for once for every configuration. So if it's very common that people say, I want my keys everywhere except for Moscow, uh, then you know, that really, you only have to do a pairing once for any particular key that uses this, even though they're, they're wrapped differently. Um, so given this, and given this, this mechanism right here, um, <clears throat> you have a very configurable way to uh, distribute keys using this broadcast mechanism, and it's been working for us, and uh, it's been live in production for a little while. And uh, that's it, here are some references. Thank you very much. We have lots of time for questions. Okay, thanks, Nick. Um, so one of the uh, features you generally want out of a broadcast encryption scheme is that two people that can't on their own get the secret can't work together to get the secret. And it seems to me you lose that when you do your splitting between the share one and share two. So in your example, for example, um, if you have the map. Uh, the, the second no, one or the original one, one? The map. Yeah, that. This one. Yeah, there. Yeah. Right? So if uh, London, so London will get share one but not share two, and Moscow can read share two but not share one, and so London and Moscow working together could get the key. Now, it may not matter in your system because you don't treat your, your right. points I think of presence as adversarial. Right, if, but if there's a compromise in both London and Moscow, I think that's, that's kind of worse. Right. But yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's a good you're point. just yeah. not it, worried it, it about... It doesn't really fit into this model because each, each location is, is not considered adversarial, as you said, it's, it's a, uh, an independent location. Um, I have a question, actually. Sure. So, uh, speaking of adversarial points of presence, so uh, Microsoft has been fighting this case about a search warrant from the U.S. in a data center in Ireland, and I guess it's going to the Supreme Court. And uh, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about the interaction between this kind of system and, and uh, what the United States government is doing. Uh, yeah. So, so one of the one of the reasons, I guess, this I don't know how well this has been borne out in court, but um, one, one of the reasons that this is built the way it is, is, is so that it's actually cryptographically impossible to uh, access a key in one of these locations that it's chosen not to, not to be in. This is, it's cryptographically enforced. So uh, for a, a court of law to say, this key is in my country, you, you can make a pretty strong argument that it actually isn't. It's actually something that is indecipherable that's that's actually in, in in the country so despite the fact that you're broadcasting the same information everywhere uh, because the keys to decrypt that information is, are not everywhere um, uh, it's it's a lot stronger than having say like an access control mechanism like a like a whitelist or a blacklist and say like can you access this yes or no um, I don't know how well that type of argument would hold up in legal uh, scenarios but um, at the very least, uh, it's it's cryptographically sound. Hope that <laughs> hope that helps. To protect uh, the master key, um, and in which country that is held? Yeah. So um, the master key is. <laughs> it, it, there's actually a pretty big difference between the the. This part right here, where someone uploads their keys and it gets put into this database, this can, it's, it's sort of, we have to lock that down, it's ephemeral, versus like the master secret, which lets you encrypt things for the rest of the world. In this case, actually, you don't actually have to have live uh, decryption data, but um, then there's this piece, where are the master keys? Uh, right now, they're in a, a location that's a lot more locked down than the rest of, of Cloudflare's network. So, um, uh, Essentially, you have different levels of access to different machines and different administrative domains, and this is in the most locked down administrative domain that we have. Are there any questions from the invisible microphone upstairs? Looks like no. Okay, so if there are no more questions, let's thank Nick again.